And this is the first time where we look at the pivotal first moments that made some of our greatest musical artists who they are today. Today we're speaking to musician, manager, producer, writer and conceptual arts terrorist, Mr Bill Drummond. It's really hard to know how to describe Bill Drummond. He was in 70s art punk band Big in Japan before becoming the manager and record label boss, uh, providing an idiosyncratic hand to the careers of 80s heroes like Echo and the Bunnymen and the Teardrop Explodes. Then things get really interesting. He wrote the definitive manual on how to get a number one single. He created, then destroyed Stadium Rave with the KLF and he burnt a million quid. He's constantly questioning his relationship with music and deconstructing the way we experience and interact with it. He's also one of the most perceptive, interesting and scarily intelligent people I've ever interviewed, as you'll hear. We start these interviews in the same way for everyone. We always ask everyone when were they first aware of music. There's three points. There isn't just one answer to this. I can remember going to a Christmas party at Penningham Prison in... Uh, Southwest Scotland, when I must have been three years old, and my father was the chaplain to the prison. So it was a, it was a Christmas party for the, the, all the children of the officers and anybody connected to the prison. Now, I guess I would have known what church music was and pipe band music was at that age, because that was naturally in our life. But we didn't have a record player. I wasn't aware of a record... Well, we didn't have a record player at home. I can't remember music on the radio. But at this, at this the Christmas party for the, for the kids at the, at the prison... There was this thing that happened on stage. There was a man who had a box in front of him here and, and there was a kind of wooden bit that stuck out of the box and there were some strings on it and he was bashing this thing. And it was the loudest noise I'd ever heard. And there was somebody else who got this thing that my granny used to wash the clothes and she was making, he was making a load of noise on that. And then there was a tea chest with a broom handle in the corner and a string and he was plucking that. And it was just... It was just just this wall of noise, and it, but it was the most exciting noise I'd ever heard in my life. And it was only afterwards, and it made me want to jump, jump up and down, but it was only afterwards I thought, that's maybe music. That's, that's maybe music as well as the music, church music or... I mean, I didn't think in terms of church music being... Or, so I, 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 but somehow that was the first lasting impression of experiencing music and nothing since has ever seemed as loud and, and of course I can look back at it and think well none of that would have been amplified and for those, those that don't know it was a skiffle band and it would have been must be 1957 or 56 maybe what about the first music that you owned that was actually yours to play and treasure and do with what you wished you see you're making a fundamental mistake there you're saying what was the first piece of recorded music? As if that somehow has a prime thing. I owned music from the word go. I was owning that music that I heard. But if you're asking me, what is the first record I owned? First record I bought was on the 17th of February, 1967. And it was Penny Lane, backed by, by Strawberry Fields. And I bought it in the uh, HMV record shop in Corby, Northamptonshire. At 4.47. What do you remember from listening to that? Back for the first time. I got home. I asked my mum, because we just got... My mum had got the, a dance at Monarch record player for Christmas. And she got the Sound of Music, the Sound of Music soundtrack. My sister got some boring jazz album. My father had got an EP by Jimmy Shand in the band. So I got this record. I brought it home. I asked her if I could put the record player on. I plugged it in, switched on. But I'd never actually put a record on before. I'd seen people do it. And it was one of those ones that... Um, it got spindle, you could stack up four or five seven inch singles. So it was a bit hard to get it down. And then, and then I realized there was the speeds, you know, because, you know, 33, 45, 78. But I got it at the right speed. And it took quite a bit to pluck up courage to put, to put the record into the, the needle into the groove. And I also, just, just after I put it in, I'd seen Top of the Pops. You know, I knew that some people leapt around to pop music. And I also knew some people you know, thought about pop music. And I didn't know if I should be one of the people that leaps around to pop music or, or one of the people that should think about it. So if I was going to think about it, maybe I should sit back on the sofa and, and just think about what I was listening to. But anyway, I got the needle into the groove. The music started. And for that first... You know, the three, the three minutes, 29 seconds that the, the, the record lasts. All I was thinking was, I own this record. This is my record. This, this is my... And I played it three times before I realised I got a B-side as well. Remember, I, I, I own the B-side as well. What about performance? Because you said there's, there's this um, uh, delineation between being a, a passive listener or a, a performer or someone that should maybe think about this. When was your first... Can you remember performing, not necessarily music... 
performing in front of a crowd or for people or doing something for the benefit or the appreciation of someone other than just yourself? Yeah, again, I'm afraid I've got to have to... <laughs> Please. Not, not bring you to account. Please. But, but one of my things, one of my, one of my problems with music is... I've always felt music should be not the performers and the, uh, and the consumers, that it should be really a thing that we're all part of. And I guess that's because... It's actually really, it's only a 20th century thing. When, when we had... When the evolution, the evolution of uh, recording technology, so music could be recorded, that's when it pushed music into being a thing that you either do or you sit and listen to. Before before the beginning of the 20th century, music was... I mean, of course, you had the, the, the great piano players or the great violinists, you know, the Paganinis and that. But it was more of a thing you did all together. So that is... I'm, I'm just skirting around the answer. The answer is... No, no, I, I, sang, I sang in a church choir when I was a kid. OK, well, let's say well, your first communal music experience when oh, you were be, with like-minded souls. I'd be church when I was a kid, yeah. And then in school. But if you're asking me when did I first get up on stage with an electric guitar and make a lot of noise, that's a different question. I'm asking that question. <laughs> okay. Uh, that would be when I was about 14. What do you remember from it? It was in the um, Girl Guide Hall, and some friends of ours uh, at school had a band. And because I could play a few chords, I went up and met up with them. And, um, and it was Sunday afternoon. It was a fantastic feeling. The kind of story of your life and career seems to kind of... Well, it, it, it's music and art in parallel. Can you remember your first um, the first piece of art, I suppose, you could? Were you always quite interested in the visual as well as aural arts? Yes, kind of like, yeah, definitely. My, my dad did uh, watercolour paintings, so that was his way of escaping and relaxing. So I'd often go off with him into the countryside near where we lived. Well, uh, he's off doing watercolour paintings and I'll be climbing trees. So I was very aware of that as a process ever since I can remember. And we used to go down and stay with my granny in um, Norwich. We used to go to the museum there in the castle and they'd got all these watercolour paintings and big oil paintings. Uh, Norwich School, it's called. Early, early 19th century. So that had a big impact on me. And I was naturally, I was into drawing at school. You know, I was always into drawing. I ended up going to art school because I could draw. So do you see uh, the art and the music as mutually? Well, the music, the music thing was never, uh, that was never planned. That was an accident. That happened. You know, I never, I didn't spend my, even though I mentioned about, you know, being able to play guitar a bit as a teenager and making a load of noise, I never had dreams of being a, a rock star or anything. That was just, that was purely accidental you know, uh, when I was 23 or 24, that started happening. So you got Big in Japan, your first yeah, that recognised was th band. Yeah, and that, that was when I was 23. I was in 77. It wasn't supposed to be a serious thing. It was never, it wasn't like we were trying to be, you know, we've read The Enemy and we want to be one of these bands. It was sitting in a pub in Matthew Street in Liverpool called The Grapes, and there was myself and this guy called Clive Langer who went on to become... A producer, successful producer, and he was in a band called Deaf School at the time. He was kind of the main musician in this band called Deaf School, who are from Liverpool, who were also from the art, art college, but I left a couple of years before that. And he was going on to me and these other two guys who kind of worked with Deaf School. One designed their sleeves, and one was the brother of the lead singer, and also he was a roadie. And he said, You've got to form a band. And, um, so he was telling us, and they were just about to go off on an American tour, and he says, you can have our equipment while we're away in America because they were going to hire equipment out there. And when, when, when we get back in three weeks' time, I want you to be a band, and I'll join you. And um, so that's, that's, that was the beginning of Big in Japan. And, it, yeah, and it was kind of high. We only lasted a year, and the uh, line-up kept changing, evolving, and, um, but I guess it was great in a way. You uh, kind of formally, I suppose, joined the music industry when you formed Zoo Records and managed Echo and the Bunnymen and Teardrop Explodes. What was the first mistake you made as a record label boss? 
Seymour Stein, who owned Sire Records, or co-owned Sire Records, and they had Talking Heads um, and, and Ramones. So obviously they're kind of big in one sense, you know, influential acts of the time, you know, late, late 70s. And he was yet to sign Madonna, but he was going to do it in a couple of years. He approached us about signing Echo and the Bunnymen. And, uh, and I remember writing a long, detailed letter to Seymour saying, well, this is, this is all very well, you know, we, we'd be up for talking to you about this, but you have to understand if they sign to your label, they will not make albums. You know, I was totally against albums. As far as I was concerned, albums were the worst thing that had ever happened to music. And I compromised in that. And he said to me, well, Bill, you know, it's a far bigger. The music industry is, you know, right now is defined by album sales. Or he didn't go completely into it. He said, I can't change that. That's, that's the way it works. So that was one thing. I compromised that. I allowed Echo and the Bunnymen to record albums. Obviously, they wanted to record albums. But, you know, I was totally against the idea of albums. And the other thing was that... Uh, Tony Wilson, who had uh, factory records in Manchester, and I had built a, a rapport between the two of us over the previous 18 months, two years. And he was always telling me, you must never sign your bands to major labels in London. And I used to say to him, well, that's all very well for you to say that, Tony. You've got, you know, you've got a comfortable job in Granada TV, you know. We're all on the dole, you know. So, but he was adamant we shouldn't have anything to do with those people down in London. Because I wasn't from Liverpool, I didn't have this fierce sense of Liverpudlian pride or anything. But he might have been right. So maybe those are two mistakes. What was the first thing on the agenda of the KLF? The first record that we did together was called All You Need Is Love, question mark. And it was only going to be a one-off. It was just an idea that, that I had about the uh, what you could do with samplers, kind of. It was also, I loved the fact that rap, early hip hop, rap, had seemed to completely re... They were presenting a complete new way of putting music together. And I, and I liked the fact that we just could just get rid of rock music, everything rock music had represented. You know, the whole guitar, bass, drums, lead singer, you know, that whole mythology that goes with it, I loved the fact that that could all just be dispensed with. And I didn't want a, us to be making music that was mimicking what um, American hip-hop or R&B, uh, not R&B, hip-hop or, or, or rap acts were doing, but to, to try and make a British version of it. And that's what we aimed to do right at the beginning. Obviously, it evolved in all sorts of different directions, but that was right at the beginning. And that was the only thing. Really, and I remember it started by I went through my record collection at the time, noting down the key every song was in and the BPM, the beats per minute of every song, and making these cross referencing things. So I could see if you could take two seconds of that, you know, something by James Brown, and you could put two seconds of that by ABBA, and you could uh, cut and sp uh, splice them together. And we didn't have obviously the sampling. Te the digital technology to do all that then, you would actually have to splice these things together. But theoretically it could work, and I like the idea of building things up like that and completely rethinking the whole way music is, has been put together. So about your first book, which I believe was the manual, is that right? In The first book I wrote. Well, was I that published. the first book you wrote? It's the first book, I've, yeah, it was the first book published, the manual, yes. Okay, which yeah. was how to have a number one 19 yeah. the easy way 1988 no how to have yeah. a number one the the easy way yeah. how do people react to that because it obviously worked um well they still do this is it, it can really surprises me it, it it hasn't been um it hasn't been in print for a long time it hasn't been in print for a long time and we often get asked by publishers do you want to reprint it and jimmy and i always say no I know, obviously it exists on the net, it's there, people want the information, but its influence carries on and on and on. Um, which in one sense I find surprising, obviously, I guess I'm flattered. Uh, I don't know how well it stands up now, but I also know it, one of the influences for me behind wanting to write it, there's a book uh, called Play Power 
by Richard Neville, which came out in about 1970 or 69, 70. And that for me was a book that sort of said, you can do what you want. I mean, it wasn't, you, you don't have to wait to be given permission. And, and I kind of wanted the manual to be like that. Don't wait for somebody to say, yes, you're allowed to make pop music now. Or yes, you've been sanctioned, you know. We've signed you to this record label, so you're now official. Oh, you, you've been written about in the NME, so we will venerate you. You know, sod all that. If you want to do it, go and do it. So that was kind of the ethos behind it. And that thing about having a number one, just, just, just doing it for the almost the sake of doing it. When did you realise that the KLF were uh, to be no more? Everybody knows that bands or singers, they have a natural life. And usually there's only one, a couple of good albums in them. I mean, some people, you know, you might get into a certain artist and you'll, you enjoy following their career. But usually it is pretty early on in their career that they make their defining record. And that's got faster and faster. You know, it's like... If you haven't done it by your third album, you're not gonna. And I and I just thought, yeah, pop pop music, you know. And we both thought it should be just it should be short term, and let's stop now. Now we had actually got some plans for other things, but we we realised no no, let's just stop now. And there's also other things we wanted to do that have nothing to do with music. And and music is a very jealous mistress. I do have to ask about another first. I have to ask, what was the first emotion you felt when you were setting fire to that first note of that alleged one million? After it had been done, and about a year or so later, there was a... We had this film. We actually had filmed the whole thing, all however long it took. And we started showing that film at places, and we felt we owed it, to at least to our families, t to come up with... A reason why you do something like that and and when we showed the film when we went out with it all people wanted to know was did you really do it you know that, well, well it could be fake no or this you know come with all these things and we realized it didn't matter how much we said or attempted to prove that this was then no this is for real this is this is the ones that didn't want to believe would would not believe and the ones that wanted to believe would want to believe and the other thing everybody wanted to know was why. And we soon realised whatever, whatever, and we felt we should come up with a reason. We should, we, you know, you do something like that, you've got to be able to justify it. And we realised that there was no way, there was never a reason that was good enough for people. So we decided this is not down to us, it's down to other people. They've got to come up with a reason, they've got to come up with a reason why somebody should want to go or why two people should want to go and burn a million pounds and the, then it was somebody who we were working with suggested to us like you're going to stop talking about it the more you talk about it the more it waters it down dissipates it you've got to you've got to have a moratorium for a certain amount of time give people enough time to uh, take on board this thing and then they can come up with reasons why this had to be done or why anybody would want to do this I know I haven't answered your questions, but that's that'll do. That's the answer I'm giving. That'll do. Not a good enough answer for my children, though. I tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the Seventeen Project for a bit. So the Seventeen Project involved you bringing together uh, groups of seventeen people into a kind of into a choir from groups, similar uh, social or uh, professional groups, and getting them to form a piece of music that, for once, that would never be recorded. That would only exist for the time of that performance. What was the first one like? I first did it as a trial in Leicester. Why Leicester? Because i got a friend there who's got a studio. He's called Kev, Kev Reverb. Uh, he had a band. Kev Reverb's a good name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I said to Kev, look, i got this, uh, there's this noise I can hear in my head and it's a choral thing. And uh, as I maybe mentioned earlier, you know, I sang in choirs as a kid. Choral music's always been a kind of thing in a natural thing for me to listen to and think about and so that's I put put together something there with him so that, that goes back 83 not 83 2003 2004 and initially it was to kind of make a kind of very primal sounding choir that didn't use uh, lyrics didn't use song structure didn't use um, rhythm 
dispensed with... It was almost like starting music again. Um, but I wanted to use big, big chords. You know, I could hear these sounds in my head, and it was wanting to put that together. And I tried it once as a performance in front of an audience and realised that was a mistake. You know, I wanted the... I wanted the uh, the uh, 17, when when it, when it's done, it's always with a different group of people. And it's just done for the for the people that are taking part. So there's never an audience. Uh, so there's no there's no so there can never be a music business structure that can embrace what I'm doing here. But it's not quite just how you mentioned it. You know, there's there's lots of there's lots of different scores that can be performed by the 17, which I've been doing all around the world, and some. Some are hardly music. Like one of the ones I did, I did it in uh, Port-au-Prince in Haiti a week before Christmas and I did it in Beijing in the autumn where I get 100 people, get a, a map of the city, I draw a circle in the map and the circumference of the circle is five kilometres. I walk around placing e each one of these 100 at 50 metre intervals all the way around. So it's quite a bit of commitment that's needed from the people taking part. And once you've got everybody on this circle and everybody's got to be able to see the, the person 50, 50 metres one side of them and 50 metres the other, and you get the first one to go, way out to the next one, and they've got to carry on the way out to the next one, and it goes all the way around. And by the time it gets back to the end, and you, think, and you can hear it coming in the distance, getting closer and closer to you. It's a great feeling. But you get it to go around five times. And that's the piece. That's all there is to it. So there's no music there to sing and dance to. But it's a, once you've done it, it's a great feeling. And it more it kind of more exists in the memory of having done it. Whereas other ones that are more like you described, where I did a... You, it was 2008 in Derby. We did a really big one there that involved 1,700 people. And it was 100 groups of 17, but it was each 17 was made up of a like 17 nurses, 17 lollipop ladies, 17 taxi drivers. Uh, so it was a real cross section of Derby. And this I was this was to celebrate the, the um, I was commissioned to put this together, celebrate the opening of a big new art centre there. And and we put this whole thing together with this mass amount of people. For this one, it was using recording technology, and each group you just get them to sing one note for five minutes and, and build this whole thing up. And then you get everybody back on a certain date, which we did in the marketplace in the middle of Derby, and they hear it back through a big PA, and then it's deleted, it's gone. That's it. It's glorious, but it's quite sad. But that's one of the reasons probably yeah. why it's glorious. I'd, it's a stupid question, but I'd, I'd, you've kind of answered it by your enthusiasm for the things you've been talking about. You're not tempted to make music for mass public consumption anymore at all because there there is there there is a beauty in in giving something and making it available forever not deleting it not making it a one off it'd be crap <laughs> you know it'd be, it'd be rubbish you know and everybody knows we all know we all know it's a zeitgeist thing as well it's not just one's own talents if one has talent it has to be at that right time with whatever else is going around which defines i mean the mistake most artists make they, they think it's them that's the the great ones and actually in fact they're just part of something they're just part of a a thing that was happening in a, at a certain time i don't know if that makes sense we have to finish the list of all these first and we do finish the last the end is we ask someone to pick a piece of music to finish it can be whatever you feel like fairport conventions uh, who knows where the time goes why it's because it's one of the greatest songs ever written. And that's the one that came into my head then. Thank you very much.